Hello, everyone. So today's topic is the leading edge of story. Uh, oftentimes in our meetings and over the years, you will know that I love referring to story, uh, pointing to my own experience that the story of creation is the story of the uncreated and playing upon that and what that means. And there's a way I want to dive deeper into this idea of story today. When we are really, really open to the experience of the beloved, then we discover the beloved in unexpected ways, not just places, but ways. So places would be the practice of presence, right? Being open to the moment in the kitchen, to the moment in the supermarket, to the moment near my car. And, and those are all, you know, give or take uh, events and, and ways as well. But there are ways, there are ways that we are called with our story to be open to the movement that's happening. So if I'm holding this glass and I rest into it, there's a movement that comes there, right? But I'm having a, primarily I would say I'm being with the glass. Well, there's an aspect of story that is leading us to the edge of our being into the becoming part with the beloved in our lives. And that's what I want to focus on today. Optional reflection questions, if you're journaling through this immersion would be, what way is my story, my life right now, putting me on the edge, leading me to the edge of my becoming? And where I am I in that process? You know, when we, when we hold true that there's an alpha and omega for me, when we hold true that there's a, an inception of divinity as consciousness and form, and it comes to its fullness and it returns to itself, when we hold that as true or possibly true, then what we discover is that all of our lives, all the movements of our lives are oriented into that direction. They are oriented that way. And we discover not only the isolated moments, but we discover the very movement of our story is the divine story. So this is a very lovely way to look at that. And with that then, with that, we discover that we find ourselves in every story as well. And we find the divine in every story. So it lets us participate even more fully in our lives. And in a way it's all about us. And in a way it's not about us at all. And we can play that dance. So I want to read you a, a it's gonna be a fairly long story from the Gospel of John. The reason I chose this story is because there are numerous individuals participating in one dramatic moment, and all of them are at different places in their own story. Different places in their own story. And it lets you tap in, wow, where am I in this story? That's part of what I'm gonna give you a chance to reflect. And it's not to set us up for judgment. It's not to say, oh man, I'm just like that person doing it again. That's not the point. The point is in the recognition of where we are in the story, it gives us the opportunity to come into that moment with understanding and compassion. And then when we provide that environment for ourselves, then that moment where we are, where we're on the edge of our story, can break us open to a new way of being in the moment. All right, so, and again, this is a, a fairly well-known story, but I'm actually going to read it from start to finish, just so you can get the nuances of it. So it's a man born blind and he receives his sight. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of God, the one who sent me while it is day. For when it is night, no one can work. As Jesus said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of his spit and anointed the man's eyes with clay, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he, but others said, no, it's somebody that looks like him. And he said, I am the man. And they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is Jesus? And the man said, I don't know. Well, they brought him to the Pharisees, this man who had been blind. And it was Sabbath day when Jesus had made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. And the man said, Jesus put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was division. So again, they said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And the blind, formerly blind man said, he must be a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. So they called his parents and they asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he see? His parents answered, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. We don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, they would be put out from the synagogue. So for the second time, they called this man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know was that I was blind and now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He told them, I told you this already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to him, though. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do anything. They answered him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us. And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out and he found him. And he said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. The man that had been blind said, Lord, I believe. So that story has a lot of players in it, right? It has a lot of players in it. You know, you've got the you've got Jesus's friends who ask a really legitimate spiritual question of the time. Here, a man was sitting there blind from birth, and a beggar, and the understanding in that consciousness was that if that happened to you, 
then somebody sinned. It was karma. Somebody sinned. Somebody did something that caused this to happen. And so they asked a very understandable question of who, who would you say it is? Do you think it was his parents? Do you think it was him? Right? And Jesus gives a, a very provocative answer. He says, it wasn't about that. It's just that something great will happen that's unexpected. And something great did happen. And in that greatness of somebody being born blind and seeing, you've got a whole range of individuals interfacing with this story. You've got the man born blind that's just elated and knows something wonderful has happened to him. You've got the neighbors that are confused and divided about whether this was their neighbor who was blind or wasn't their neighbor who was blind, which is very interesting, right? Since he could verify who he was. You've got them staying divided when they hear who opened the eyes. And they even went so far to take him to the, the reigning authorities. And the authorities question him. And immediately they put up guards because the healing had happened on what was designated that if you were, if you were truly, truly of God, you kept the Sabbath free of all work. Well, Jesus did it on a Sabbath. And so then you've got the division of those in the leading community going, well, that automatically is telling us this can't be of God. But then you've got the others that are tapping into the experience saying, but this is too miraculous. Maybe it's challenging us to change the way we're looking at things. So you've got that division happening. And then you've got them reaching out to the parents and the parents being equivocal, recognizing, yes, our son was born blind, recognizing, yes, he now sees, then maybe they really didn't know who healed their son, but they did put the responsibility in his hands, which seems to say they're taking a more distant approach to it. And so what happens? The one person that's willing to engage it, that's the one that now has the sight, is put on the hot seat again to recount the same story. And then it goes deeper, right? Because they poke at it. How can this man do this? He's got to be a sinner. And the man just says a realistic question. Isn't good of God? And if good is of God, then certainly what just happened to me has to be of God. And what ends up happening, he's cast out for that belief. And then you've got the person who healed him showing up, giving the man a chance to go even deeper not with his commitment to him, but go even deeper with his own clarity of what is of God in his life. So in that story, you can see that there are all these different people in different stages of understanding of what is of God. And though you can probably isolate some of it's coming out of fear, some of it's coming out of power, underlying it all is that where there's understanding, there's awakening. And where there's not understanding, there's ignorance. Because where there is understanding, there's awareness. So even though we can say the Pharisees had a block to it, or the parents had a block, or those that were divided had a block, even though we can cite the example that they had the block to it, that block is just simply keeping them in what? Keeping them in ignorance. And for that, the one person in the story that had awakened because it had happened to him, he was invited to go even further. Awareness builds on awareness. So where are you in the story of your life compared to this story? So if this story were kind of an example or a metaphor or a... a a pointer to your own life in, in relation to something that is disputable of being a miracle or of being something of the divine. Where are you in relation to it and in your relation to your freedom to it? 
Does that make sense? Because where we assent to the simplicity of miracles, of magic, of awareness, where we assent to it, where we open ourselves to it, there will be our leading edge in our story. Again and again, we'll be plunged into the unknown. We can't make sure we're going to travel with safety. We can't make sure we're going to travel not losing friends. We can't make sure we're going to travel knowing everywhere we're going to go. But we can find that we can be on the leading edge of our story of awakening. And in that, we can find our anchor and our security and our consolation. And as we stay there in the leading edge, we experience something that is our essential nature, and that is freedom. So again, with your optional homework, as you look into this story and identify, where are you on this? Do you equivocate a little? Do you create some divisions around certain signs you're getting or miracles? Are you all in? Are you not in at all? Are you holding on to things that served you in the past that no longer serve you? For instance, the Pharisees that thought, well, this must be of God because how could he not be blind anymore? Only God could do that. Those Pharisees were then going to the edge to let go of the things they had given their whole hearts to, resting on the Sabbath and all the other rules. So we're all in these different places. And when we meet ourselves in that place, when we understand who we are at that place in our lives, we have the opportunity to be there with unconditional acceptance so that the story of our lives can emerge and we can awaken into the next level and next step of our freedom. So with that, today's meditation is, I know I pulled up my mala. I'm not actually using my mala. I just feel like holding it. But we're going to do a breath meditation. And uh, we have done this meditation maybe twice before over the years. Super, super lovely one. Super easy one. I'm, I know you've found enjoyment with it. I know I love it. And because we're talking about leading edge, I thought a leading meditation through the spine would be very helpful. So we're going to let the breath and the gaze, two parts of yourself, your breath and your gaze, we're going to let them move from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. And we're going to begin by letting the gaze pull the breath. I've used the image of your gaze being a kite and your breath being like the kite string, just following it along. We're going to start with the gaze pulling the breath on the inhale up to the crown and on the exhale descending, like a kite would descend as the air moves and changes. So it goes high and then it comes back down and the, the tail kind of gracefully comes behind it on the exhale. We'll be doing that and then we'll move into switching and let the breath pull the gaze and see what happens there. All right. So I invite you to close your eyes. If you've not already done so, let your inward gaze come to notice the breath without managing the breath, manipulating it. Just let the gaze be present to the breath, noticing the inhale and the exhale. Now after the next exhale, actually let's begin with the inhale. After the next exhale, bring in through your nose the largest inhale you're able to do. And hold for a moment. And now exhale through the mouth. Oh. 
and bring the breath and the gaze down to the base of the spine. Staying with the push out of the breath, you're holding your breath right now. And on the next inhale, with your gaze, pull the breath up the spine. So you're inhaling through the nose, pulling the breath up the spine, all the way to the crown. And you're pausing. And then on the next exhale, when you can hold it no longer, let the gaze pull the breath down the spine. The gaze is washing the spine with the breath. Just like you'd see in those car washes, the snakes coming across the windshield. Inhaling up, pulling the breath up the spine. Exhaling down, pulling the breath down. And continue at your own pace. Keep with the focus, pulling the breath up and down the spine. Washing the spine with the light energy of oxygen. The pulsing frequency that is emitted when we use our intention. And after the next exhale, reverse the rolls and let the breath inhale up, billowing up the spine and let the gaze follow the breath. It's billowing up and the gaze is following it. Now the string is on the kite. And then the breath is descending from the crown back to the base with the gaze following. You might make a little noise so it's easier to follow the breath. Uh. Five more full breaths.
as they exhale. Let go of the focus, let go of the movement up and down the spine and just breathe naturally. And as we begin to end this meditation, just notice what you're experiencing right now. What are the sensations in the body, in the heart, in the mind? And when you're ready, bring the palms together in front of the heart and open the eyes with namaste. Namaste, my friends. And just another way to put your examination of the story is we come to the leading edge where we find the divine there. When we can be honest without judgment. Examine each character in that story and see if you can find where is honest without judgment for you. Blessings.